Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of Leviticus, the book of holiness. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Wadsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of the book of Le Leviticus? Well, we're about to discuss the last type of sacrifice uh, that God ordains uh, to Moses for the people of Israel. Uh, the first one that we discussed in the book of Leviticus was the burnt offering. This is where the entire offering was burned up. Nothing was to be left over. Uh, this was a primary atonement sacrifice uh, for the people. Uh, and then the second sacrifice we looked at was the grain sacrifice or the cereal sacrifice where they would take a small portion of it and sacrifice a memorial portion and give the rest uh, to the priest for food for them to eat. Um, and then we also discussed the uh, peace offering. Uh, also, as we said, could be called the fellowship offering. Uh, this was one that was a voluntary offering of thanksgiving or because a, a person fulfilled a vow and they would uh, bring a portion to the temple enough for them, uh, the priest to have some, and an extended uh, group to share in the sacrifice. So this was a big common meal that could be shared uh, in rejoicing in the presence of God uh, at his tabernacle and, and eventually his temple. Um, then last week we talked about the sin offering. And as we said, again, sometimes this terminology we already have a Christian idea, but the sin offering was more of what I would call a purification offering. It had to do with the fact that sin pollutes uh, and therefore it pollutes people, but it also polluted the temple uh, or the tabernacle, man's access to God. And so therefore part of the uh, tabernacle needed to be cleansed as a part of the purification uh, from sin. And so uh, tonight we'll look at the last uh, in the series of uh, specific types of sacrifices that the Lord uh, mandate. We'll pick up in Leviticus uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 14. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock valued in silver shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary for a guilt offering. We shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing and shall add a fifth to it and give it to the priest. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. Bruce, what is the guilt offering? Again, I think uh, when we hear that phrase, uh, it brings a certain New Testament idea to mind about our guilt in general. But really, the guilt sacrifice could perhaps best be expressed in our language as a reparations a restitution, a compensation. So this had to do with the fact that in some way the Lord or others had been defrauded and there had to be restitution paid as well as a sacrifice uh, made. And in this case, it was a specific sacrifice of a ram and that had to be made for the guilt uh, sacrifice. And then atonement could be made uh, for the person uh, involved. It, in the first instance here, it says concerning holy things. Uh, this appears to be a, an allusion to uh, things donated to the temple, uh, things that were supposed to be given uh, to the Lord, things that were owed to the Lord would have been holy things. But to get a, an example of what a holy thing is and a violation of this, we can look no further than uh, Leviticus chapter 22, uh, verse 14 uh, through 16. 
And if anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally, he shall add the fifth of its value to it and give the holy thing to the priest. They shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to the Lord, and so cause them to bear iniquity and guilt by eating their holy things. For I am the Lord who sacrifices them, sanctifies them. Uh, again, this is like most of the earlier sacrifices. This is for unintentional sins. It's where something was made holy, dedicated to the Lord, and perhaps someone who was not a priest uh, ate of the meat, not knowing that it was a holy thing. Later, they discover that, or uh, they failed, neglected in some way to give their 10% to the Lord and therefore they now are making up for that. Plus notice is plus 20% on top of that is the uh, restitution required. And when it talks about the shekel, uh, it's saying, I think that you don't have to give, you may not have the exact same thing to give, but you can pay the value of it uh, in the specific shekels that are used uh, at the temple. So here we have, I think, a, uh, a specific example of the kind of unintentional thing that might occur. And then he goes on and makes a broader, I think, uh, statement uh, in uh, chapter 5, or verse uh, 17 uh, through 19. If anyone sins doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. So Bruce, uh, what is... Uh, the nature uh, of the guilt offering. Um, it's interesting. I think here what he's doing is building off the previous example, defining that one as uh, sins against holy things. Now he's saying if, if in any way you have defrauded the Lord in any kind of way, even beyond those things that are holy things, uh, you can and need to make a guilt offering. It doesn't mention here about making restitution, but I think that's implied as he gave it in the first example and now continues on to illustrate more broadly uh, this isn't just limited to holy things. The guilt offering can be given for other things as well. And uh, it doesn't say in either one of these passages or the next one on the guilt offerings that they must make a confession of their sin However, that was an essential part of this, and we can read about that in Numbers uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 5 through 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel. When a man or woman commits any of the sins that people commit by breaking faith with the Lord, and that person realizes his guilt, he shall confess his sin that he has committed and he shall make full restitution for his wrong, adding a fifth to it and giving it to him, whom, to, giving it to him to whom he did the wrong. So we see that, you know, a, a similar type situation requires confession. And you can imagine uh, for, for one to seek a sacrifice, one had to identify a particular type of sin that one had committed and uh, one had to then make appropriate restitution in light of that uh, confession. And so that's what guilt offerings were for. They were designed to recognize you had broke faith with God himself by uh, not doing the right thing in his commands. You're supposed to be his people. You've committed to do his will. And if you fail to do so by neglect, and the idea here is you maybe didn't understand at the time that you had violated the will of God. Later, you realize it and feel some uh, responsibility. 
uh, maybe you don't you don't know exactly what you did wrong, but you want to make things right. And that seems to be the generic uh, nature of this, but it's the same kind of sacrifice and trying to uh, make restitution for your failure in those areas. And then I think it's uh, interesting, it goes uh, ahead and gets more specific uh, in chapter six of, um, of Leviticus when he defines one last uh, guilt offering with a variety uh, of causes. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security, or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, and any of all the things that people do and sin thereby. If he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord and he shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. Uh, so Bruce, what are the types of sins behind the guilt offering? Um, well, as we've noted, most of the sins that the sacrifices were offered for were sins that were unintentionally done. The assumption seems to be if you're a, a part of the covenant with Yahweh, you're going to <clears throat> want to do the right thing. Occasionally, you may be uninformed or ignorant about something and uh, violate the will of God, but surely uh, you're not going to do it with a high hand uh, or with some sort of arrogance that uh, God's law doesn't apply to you. But here we have examples of where it's not unintentional, uh, but instead these were intentional things uh, that a person did. And these all appear to be uh, things having to do with property, perhaps. Therefore, there could be restitution for it. For example, it says uh, in the matter of a deposit or security. So somebody leaves something with you or somebody gives you a deposit uh, down payment for our land. And then later they decide to, to take that deposit back or they come to uh, collect on the final payment and you say, well, you didn't make a deposit. Oh yeah, I did, but there are no witnesses to this. Well, what happens when one person charges another person wrong? Well, you go before the priest, and if both people deny it, each person has to swear before God that uh, they did the right thing and they're telling the truth. And so, or say, for example, you have, it's robbery also. <laughs> you actually stole from somebody or have oppressed your neighbor, meaning taken advantage of them because they were lower in the uh, social uh, status than you, or found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely. So it appears in all these cases, um, they couldn't prove that this person had done wrong. Why? Because it takes two or three witnesses. And if one person says they did me wrong, there are no witnesses beyond that one person you can't find a person guilty if they swear, I didn't do it. But I think this guilt offering is offering an opportunity for the guilty party to finally fess up and make some restitution, even though they initially denied it. Uh, they have an opportunity to get right with God as well as to get right with their neighbor by making that 20% plus restitution for whatever they had defrauded uh, their neighbor. Now, the reason why I think this might work is let's look back at um, what was said in Exodus 22, 
about these kind of uh, sins and violations when you could prove that it was true, the consequences were more severe. Chapter 22, verse 7 to 9 of Leviticus. If a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to keep safe and it is stolen from the man's house, then if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. For every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox or a donkey or a sheep or a cloak or for any kind of lost thing or which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before the Lord. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. So if you could prove that a person was guilty of these type of crimes, of robbery, et cetera, uh, you had to pay double, not just pay them back plus 20%. So there's an incentive to make the guilt offering because it's less than if you were proven guilty, you would have to pay 200%. Uh, and so here we have an incentive to get right with your neighbor whom you defrauded as well as with God. So I think that's what the guilt offering was about. And it had as a part of it, the idea of making reparations or restitution to try to make things right. Uh, not only before God with the sacrifice of the animal, but also with making either in numeric compensation or giving uh, what you had uh, taken back plus uh, 20 percent. Uh, that's, I think, uh, what was intended by the guilt offering. Let's look uh, a little later in chapter seven when God gives some instructions uh, to the priest about how they're to handle the guilt sacrifice in chapter 7, verse 1, uh, following. This is the law of the guilt offering. It is, mostly, it is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, they shall kill the guilt offering, and its blood shall be thrown against the sides of the altar, and all its fat shall be offered, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The guilt offering is just like the sin offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it, and the priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering that he has offered. And every grain offered baked in the oven, and all that is prepared on a pan or a griddle shall belong to the priest who offers it. And every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall be shared equally among all the sons of Aaron. So. Bruce, how does the guilt offering apply to us today? Well, uh, first, let's just uh, note that it's very similar, the process that the priest is to go through, as we covered last week in the sin offering. Uh, the blood is poured at the base of, of the altar. Um, and the priest is allowed to eat the food of the guilt offering as well. And so there are the similarities between the two. So how does this apply to us? What's interesting, uh, first, let's look at a, a very important Old Testament text that uh, gives us a vision for what the Messiah would be as the suffering servant of the Lord. And I'm referring to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. And in Isaiah chapter 53, let's look at some of the verses, verses 5 through 7 and then verse 10, and uh, then we'll reflect on what it's saying. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned 
everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So verse 10 says uh, literally uh, that uh, the Lord crushes him and makes him a guilt offering. So this suffering servant of the Lord is making a sacrifice. And I think earlier he talked about peace, doing something similar to the peace offering. Uh, he's doing something similar to the burnt offering, but it's also referred to here as a guilt offering. We see that it says, you know, things that are clear that allude to Christ, pierced for our transgressions. And again, crushed not for his sin, but for others. Uh, by his wounds, we've been healed. We have all gone astray like sheep, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, but he opened not his mouth, but like a lamb before the shearer was silent, even though he must make a guilt offering, not for himself, but he was the sacrifice uh, that restores us uh, in our relationship with God and one another. So I think, again, like all the sacrifices, the Old Testament, uh, the ultimate consummation of all those is the sacrifice of Christ. Um, and kind of drawing on that, I think it might be good to uh, look in the New Testament where this passage is clearly the backdrop, the suffering servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53 as a model for Jesus. And then Jesus, of course, becomes a model for us. So in 1 Peter uh, 2, uh, verse 21 uh, through 25. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So our calling in Christ is to a suffering servant of the Lord. Our example of how to deal with unjust suffering. Now, sometimes I suffer because I do something wrong. Well, that's, that's uh, on me. But there are times, as Christ is the perfect example, of where the sinless one suffers for the sinners. And yet notice, even though Jesus, there was no sin, in his life. Uh, he didn't commit any sin, as it said. No deceit was found in him. Uh, but when he suffered for us, he didn't, you know, spew out a lot of angry uh, language. Um, he instead entrusted himself to God who judges justly. And so, therefore, he bore our sin. And uh, although we have been stray sheep who've been brought back to our true shepherd through this suffering servant, the Lord's sacrifice, a guilt offering that satisfied what God needed in order to have a restored fellowship with us. Uh, but I think it's very important for us to remember our responsibility uh, is to be willing to buckle up under unjust suffering. You know, some people are shocked when they suffer unjustly. I don't know why people are so shocked. It, it's the way the world is. You, you, you don't get what you deserve, either bad 
are good uh, in this life. Uh, and surely you have to suffer some for doing the right thing in spite of the fact that others are doing it in an unjust way, just as it did Christ. So Christ is our perfect example. And thank goodness he made himself a guilt offering that we might have uh, true access uh, to God through him. And might as sheep that have wandered away, we've been brought back to the true shepherd uh, of our soul. So uh, with that, I think we've covered pretty well the guilt offering. But let's look at uh, a couple of sections that we didn't cover, I don't think, earlier about the actions of the priest and the various sacrifices to kind of wrap up the first seven chapters. We'll go back to chapter 6, uh, verse 8, and pick up there in Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the on the earth of the of the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen garment on his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it and shall burn on the fat of the peace of off fat of the peace offering. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. So Bruce, what are the unique instructions to the priest about the burnt offering? Well, there are two kind of interesting details, I think. One is about apparel. Um, in the temple, when they were performing their duties, they wore a more luxurious garment uh, made of linen. And when they performed the duties of the burnt offering, etc., moving the ashes, they were to do this in that uh, particular outfit. But when they left the temple or tabernacle confines and went outside the camp to dump the residue of the ashes, uh, they were to put on common garb uh, and not take the sacred uh, garments they wore in the temple. Uh, so uh, just a, a point of interest, it was trying to draw the attention of the people to how special access to God was. Uh, being close to God, making sacrifices to God, uh, that this was a special uh, situation. The priests were given special access uh, to God. Therefore, uh, they had to uh, dress appropriately and then take those off when going out to do ordinary tasks beyond uh, the space of the temple. And then an even more interesting point here is that it says you're not to let the fire go out. So once they offer the sacrifice, they're to make sure there's a fire continually. Now, the, the times they might have sacrifice one after another coming, but at other times there might be a space of time where there are no sacrifices. When the last bit of a burnt offering and the, the fatty portions drip down and, and the fire is near extinguishing, they need to add wood to that fire so the fire doesn't go out day or night. And I think the significance of this was that the fire in the tabernacle, the fire later in the temple was to burn perpetually, unendingly, because again, the temple was the place of God's presence. And this was evidence that God was always with his people because the fire never went out. Now the fire is significant because when uh, Moses first made the altar and put the wood on it, God ignited the fire from heaven. So if you will, it was heavenly fire. And so they were not to let that flame go out, even though they added wood to it, they were to keep the flame that God had started going on endlessly. An unquenchable fire was the idea that symbolized God's uh, divine presence uh, among his people. Now it's interesting, I think that's the backdrop to what uh, the apostle Paul was alluding to. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 16 uh, through 19. 
Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. So just like the fire shouldn't be quenched, what is the divine presence in us? It's the Holy Spirit, the gift of the, his presence we receive uh, at our baptism. And that continues to be God's divine spark and presence within us throughout our lives, unless we quench it, uh, we destroy its presence and, and God's spirit is removed from us. And so uh, just like you don't want the fire to go out in the temple, we don't want to quench the spirit. And the way that we don't quench the spirit is by rejoicing always. There's always a lot to complain about, but we choose to be rejoicing. We pray not just uh, occasionally, but unceasingly. And we give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ for us. That's how we go about living the presence of God, being the temple of God, where praises and thanksgiving and prayers go up to God because God's unquenchable spirit is within us. And we don't want to do anything that might put that fire out for it is our life. And so I think a very a powerful uh, example in the New Testament of the significance of the fire not going out. And then in Hebrews uh, chapter 13, uh, I think it's verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 15, and verse eight we've alluded to before, refers to our continual sacrifice today. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our of lips that acknowledge his name. So what do we offer continually as a sacrifice? Well, we offer praise of God. We, it's the fruit of lips that acknowledge him, confess him. You know, we acknowledge that we are not self-made people. We are not good in and of ourselves. We confess that it's God that makes the difference in our lives. We acknowledge him in everything that we do, and we continually pray to him, acknowledge him in our private life, but also in our public life as well. That's how we offer continual sacrifice to God. The fruit of our lips uh, are an opportunity uh, to do so. And then let's look at the uh, last section we'll look at tonight. Uh, again, part of the priestly duties, Leviticus 6, verse 14, and following about the grain offering. And this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the, in front of the altar, and one shall take from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering and its oil and all the frankincense that is on the grain offering and burn this as its memorial portion of the altar, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the rest of it, Aaron and his son shall eat. It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting, they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my food offerings. It is a thing most holy, like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it as decreed forever throughout your generations from the Lord's food offerings. Whatever touches them shall become holy. But the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is the offering that Aaron and his sons shall offer to the Lord on the day when he is anointed, a tenth of an ephah of fine, of fine flour as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning and half in the evening. It shall be made with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it well mixed in baked pieces like a, like a grain offering and offer it for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The priest from among Aaron's sons who is anointed to succeed him shall offer it to the Lord as decreed forever. The whole, of, the whole of it shall be burned. Every grain offering of a priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. How does, the, how does this distinguish which offerings may be eaten by the priest? Well, he made a distinction between when the people came to offer a grain sacrifice, 
they just took a small memorial piece of that and burned that on the altar. The rest was, uh, whether baked or whatever form it was in, uh, was given to the priest and, and they shared this. This is how they sustained themselves. Here they were working at the tabernacle all day. Uh, they couldn't get out and work like the rest of the people. They lived off the offerings that the people brought the Lord and the grain offerings they shared in. But the priests themselves were required to offer grain offerings to the Lord. But their grain offering was to be completely burned up on the altar. They couldn't benefit in some way from a sacrifice that they brought. They could benefit from the sacrifice of others, but he made a distinction that when they brought their grain offerings, it must be completely consumed uh, on the altar of the Lord. And so he just uh, tried to teach him, you know, you can't, you know, benefit uh, yourself from your own uh, uh, sacrifices. And uh, you need to learn that to depend on the Lord and the graciousness and the givingness of others as they sacrifice the grain offerings to him. As I think about all these uh, sacrifices, of course, the book of Hebrews talked quite extensively about the, the role and importance of sacrifices and Christ's role. I think there's a real good summary thought about this in chapter uh, 7 of uh, Hebrews, uh, verse 26 and 27. And with this, we'll wrap up. It was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So the unique distinction of Jesus as a priest of God or a high priest of God is he didn't have to offer a grain sacrifice for himself or a sin sacrifice for himself or atone for himself because he was holy and innocent, uh, unstained in any way by sin, separated from sinners in that regard, and, and eventually exalted in the heavens when he was raised from the dead and ascended to the Father. Um, he had no need, like the other priests, uh, to make daily uh, sacrifices, because these sacrifices we're talking about, the burnt offering, the grain offerings, uh, and the various offerings would go on every day, repeatedly. But instead, where Christ's sacrifice is unique, is that it's a, as it says here, a once for all. And this is a very distinctive a Greek expression, means it happened at one time, and the effect of it is a lasting effect. And so Christ's once for all sacrifice at the cross has a continuing effect, uh, providing forgiveness and salvation uh, for all of us who put our faith in his sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice. And so uh, we, he didn't have to offer and doesn't have to continually offer some sort of daily sacrifices he instead offered the perfect, unique, once for all sacrifice for us. And we, of course, are the beneficiaries of that. And we offer sacrifices, but they're of a more spiritual nature, uh, sharing what we have, um, living holy lives, for we have been made by Christ, uh, priest of God. And we also are the temple of God, where God dwells through the spirit. And literally, our lives are a worship to God as we allow God to express himself uh, through our lives. So we have access to God. We have a ministry of priesthood to God that the ancient Israelites couldn't have. And we have the perfect sacrifice of Christ. And so we ought to be very grateful when we read about all these different types of sacrifices made under the Old Testament to realize that God was prefiguring uh, the need for an ultimate sacrifice, telling them that they had to continually offer these sacrifices, reminding them of their sinfulness, 
and their need to restore their relationship continually with God. Now, because of Christ, we have a perpetual relationship with God based on our faith in him and what he has done for us. And praise be to God for his incomparable uh, sacrifice of Christ. May we always be filled with praise and thanksgiving for all that we have in him. No matter what else is going on in our life, we always have something to be grateful, thankful, and to praise God about for what he has done for us in Christ. With that, uh, we wrapped up the first seven chapters, and I'll ask John, if you will, to give us a, a word of prayer as we close. We thank you for blessing us so richly with your son and whom we live and exist. Father, you have given us a way uh, to eternal life through him. And we thank you for his perfect sacrifice that we uh, would not have to worry about uh, anything that would keep us from seeing you. Father, we pray that uh, all we do and say is pleasing to you. Uh, let our light shine in this world into a, in a dark world um, that men would know that you are still a very present God. We thank you for Bruce, our teacher, uh, that you've anointed him with an ability to share uh, your word in a way that we can use it uh, in ready fashion. Thank you for all in attendance, live, and those who are watching the recorded version. We ask your continued blessings in Jesus' name.